reading from the book of Genesis. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourself. And after that, we may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant, who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, Where is your wife Sarah? And he said, There in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent's entrance behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of woman. So Sarah laughed at herself, saying, After I have grown old, my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh? And say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? <laughs> At the set time, I will return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, Oh, yes, you did laugh. The word of the Lord. Thank you, God. Now we will read Psalm 116 in unison. I love the Lord because he has heard the voice of my supplication, because he has inclined his ear to me whenever I call upon him. How shall I repay the Lord for all the good things he has done for me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his servants. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant and child of your handmaid. You have freed me from my bonds. I will offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all of his people. In the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. Hallelujah. A reading from Paul's letter to the Romans. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to his grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, <laughs> and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory, Glory to, you, to you, Lord Christ. Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few, and therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And then Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the Canaan, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse the lepers. Cast out demons. You receive without payment, give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals or a staff or laborers who deserve their food. Whatever town or village you enter, find out who in it is working and stay there until you leave. As you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. And if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that house or town. Truly, I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. See, I am sending you out like sheep into the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. The word of the Lord. Thanks. 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 Knock on the wrong door, pull up into the wrong driveway, mistake another's car for your own, and your life may be at risk. Our trust in one another and in the rule of law is broken on all sides for different reasons. Politicians, news outlets, and social media divide us into hostile camps that hurl words at each other like weapons. In this world, that feels increasingly dangerous and isolating, the scriptures this morning speak to us of hospitality. In Genesis, Abraham is sitting, maybe dozing, in the shade of his tent flap in the heat of the day. 
on a very hot June day in Texas, it's easy to feel the heaviness of his limbs and his reluctance to stir except to reach for a cool drink. We can almost hear the flies buzzing. But when Abraham suddenly sees three men standing near his tent, he jumps up and runs to greet them. Is it because he knows what we know, that these men are messengers from God? Does he throw off his mid-afternoon stupor because the Lord has brought by for a visit? More likely, Abraham sees exactly what we're told that he sees, three men standing near his tent. What motivates Abraham is simply his duty under the desert law of hospitality. In the ancient world, hospitality was at the center of the social structure. The word itself comes from the same root as both host and guest. More telling, hospitality shares the same root as hostility, as host in its meaning of the multitude of an advancing army, and as hostage, which originally described a guest held as collateral by an innkeeper until the bill was settled. In language and in practice, hospitality and vulnerability are inseparable. What distinguishes a guest from a hostage is that fragile thing called trust. When Abraham welcomes his guests and provides for their needs, he's taking a risk. He's inviting potential enemies into his unguarded domestic space. His guests likewise are taking a risk. They are becoming vulnerable to Abraham by placing themselves at his mercy and accepting whatever food and drink he puts before them. Think of picking up, picking up a hitchhiker on the side of the road. It's hard to say who is more vulnerable, the driver or the hitcher. What parent hasn't warned their children against the dangers of both? Hospitality inevitably involves risk. But in the ancient culture of the desert, with immense distances of arid land that could only be crossed at the pace of a human being or animal, the refusal of hospitality could be a matter of life and death. So to encourage hospitality despite the danger, the community held as sacred the guest-host relationship. Its violation by either guest or host was sacrilege and abomination. Into this sacred space that holds our common vulnerability and need for one another, Abraham welcomes his visitors. And when he does, he and Sarah receive a gift that's almost too wonderful to be believed, the news that Sarah will at last conceive and bear a child. In Matthew's Gospel, we glimpse again this sacred space of hospitality. Jesus sends out his disciples to proclaim the good news that the kingdom of God has come near and to share the kingdom gifts of healing and new life. They are sent without money in their belts, forced to be dependent on the generosity of strangers. Jesus knows that not everyone to whom the disciples will go will offer hospitality. But where hospitality is offered, he expects them to accept it. They are to enter into that risky space of mutual vulnerability. Why? Because that is the only way to share the good news of the kingdom. It is the only space in which we can offer or receive the good news that God is incarnate in this world, that God's kingdom has come near. <clears throat> One Friday evening last summer, my husband, Billy, set out a live trap to lure a raccoon that was ravaging our bird feeder, intending to relocate the vandal some miles away. Unfortunately, what he found in the trap on Saturday morning was a skunk. <laughs> the two of them immediately <coughs> faced a hospitality problem. <laughs> to set the skunk free, Billy had to get within the skunk's spray range to release the trap door and clamp it open. The skunk, on the other hand, could only escape by taking the risk of passing once again 
through the trap entrance. It eventually happened. Although even with the enticement of an apple core, several hours passed before the skunk accepted my husband's hospitable gesture. <laughs> I think it's fair to say that these days we are all struggling to find ways to approach the skunk without getting sprayed. <laughs> now don't misunderstand me. I think we take turns being the skunk and the one being sprayed. But for the last few years, it has felt increasingly difficult to be in community with people who have opinions that differ from our own, even in the church. We can't seem to speak out on an issue without others feeling judged, shamed, or threatened, which triggers a hostile response, which then triggers our own defensive instinct to attack. Jesus calls us to announce the nearness of God's kingdom of love and reconciliation. But instead, fear is driving us to desecrate the sacred spaces of human relationship. When Jesus sends us out as his disciples, he isn't being naive. He knows that he's not sending us to camp out <coughs> to sing Kumbaya with friends. I am sending you out, he says, as sheep among wolves. As sheep among wolves. Jesus knows exactly what kind of a world we live in. A world with teeth a world that crucifies. And yet, he sends us out as sheep. We can't help but wonder why. There doesn't seem to be much future in being a sheep among wolves. But Jesus, who faced the reality of the cross, knows that it is only when we go out as sheep in a predatory world of wolves that we are able to see those who are preyed upon. Only when we are vulnerable can we identify with the vulnerable, as Jesus did, with the crucified, instead of with the powerful who crucify. And just as importantly, we are sent out as sheep because sheep follow their shepherd, and we must be willing to follow Jesus. When we aren't, when we refuse to be led by a vision of God incarnate in the world in the bodies of the suffering, then we ourselves become wolfish. We begin engaging the world as one who preys upon others. We join packs and we prowl restlessly for the chance to bring down anyone who encroaches on our territory, whether it's our country, our homes, our precious opinions, privileges, prejudices, or illusions. We do whatever it takes to feel invulnerable. I'm being unfair here to actual wolves, but the language of scripture and preaching is metaphor. Wolfish human beings are far more dangerous than the wolf that God created. God created us to be in loving, and vulnerable relationship with each other. And when we are not, we destroy and we suffer. True relationship is always risky, but it is the sacred space where we can speak and hear the good news that God is incarnate in our world. It's the sacred space in which the risen Christ invites us to his table where the hostility of the cross is answered by the hospitality of the Eucharist. It's no wonder that we long for the time when we can come again as weary wolves to the table of the Lamb, the Lamb who offers us his very body and blood as a sign that God provides another way of being with each other, a way of forgiveness and mutuality. The political tensions of the present time don't excuse us from the Christ-like hospitality to which we're called. We can't wait for things to return to some past version of normal before we seek ways to talk with one another without provoking or spewing toxic words 
that saturate us in shame and condemnation. God waits to be encountered in the spaces between us. When we hear a stance or opinion that rouses our defenses, can we pause long enough to examine what it is that we fear losing and to ask if it's something that we can imagine Christ would bless? Can we discipline ourselves to speak honestly without demonizing those who disagree? Can we forgive those who reject the kingdom of God even while we continue to make it known? It was in the vulnerable space of hospitality that Abraham learned that Sarah would bear the promised heir. Who knows what revelations await us when we follow Christ into sacred relationships of risk and trust. Amen.